tastes like grass. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this thing is huge. Most of the things that are on your plate mm -hmm. are foraged. I recently came across the concept of foraging while researching the Nordic way of life. There's a law in the Nordic countries called, I'm not gonna try to pronounce that because I know I'm gonna butcher it, but it means freedom to roam or every man's right. And this basically means there's no trespassing laws in those countries. So you can camp, ski, hike, and even forage on public property. But Nicole, you live in LA. How does foraging apply to you? Believe it or not, foraging is actually a really accessible activity. Just a little bit of research is required to find areas where you can forage. And sure, there's a bunch of community gardens, but we're here to do the real deal, picking and eating wild plants. Which leads me to what I'm doing here today. I'm out here in the valley with an LA-based professional forager, Pascal. He's gonna teach me how to forage and not only that, but I'm challenging myself to make an edible and delicious meal. So let's get the show on the road. So Pascal, can you tell me where we're at today? We are in the middle of the Los Angeles forest on a private property. And what are we gonna find? We are going to find all kinds of different stuff. This is a good time of the year. We had some rain. We have a lot of green showing up. We're gonna find a lot of wild edible. Sweet, let's do this. Let's do it. This one right there. What do we have here? So this one is called chickweed. And the way to identify it is you're looking for pointy leaves. They are opposite to each other. Mm -hmm. and they go by 90 degrees. So you have two, 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 always by 90 degrees. Taste it. Mm. Very mild, nice green. So this is invasive species. That's actually invasive, yeah. The one that's native is that one right here. You see that small one? This is a, oh. this is miner's lettuce. This is all miner's lettuce, huh? Yeah. Gorgeous. It looks like a lower uh, octopus, kind of. It does. You know, everything comes from the same location. It's beautiful in salad. And this one, less flavored than the chickweed, but it's mild green. Tastes taste like grass. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so with foraging, you're kind of redefining what a weed is. Pretty right. much. It's like you, you actually take what people call weed, and you can turn them into gourmet food. So this is pretty much hunter-gatherer hunter food. Cool, so we're like cavemen right We now. are cavemen. <laughs> hey, you're walking on the food. Oh, what? What are we looking at? <laughs> oh, la, la. This one is invasive plant called charvo. Think of it as a mix of carrot, cilantro, and parsley all put together in terms of flavor. And then you can chew on it. Does it taste good? Does it taste like a mix of parsley, cilantro, churros? Whoa! Whatever. It's like layered yeah, with flavors. Yeah, 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 totally. That is really cool. The only thing to be very careful is it looks nearly identical to a very poisonous plant called poison hemlock. All right. If I were to eat poison hemlock like yeah, that, yeah. would I be poisoned? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. It doesn't take a lot to so die. You, so, oh, okay. Yeah. So you don't want to taste it? No. Okay. But one of the differences on poison hemlock, you have no hair whatsoever. Do you see any hair on it? Even tiny. Oh, on the stem? Yeah. Yeah, like little baby hairs. Good, that's it. That, okay. That already tells you it's not poison hemlock. Okay. So if you are new to foraging, it's much better if you don't touch anything that looks like parsley. Score, take a look. Oh, wow. Okay. So they're not big, but you know what? So the oyster mushroom, they grow on tree. They're dying. So mm -hmm. that tree is dying. Do you usually use a stick like this? Oh, just, no, oh, you, oh. Okay, there we go. So you notice no stems? Oh, this guy's hard. Yeah, this one's a little bit dehydrated. So this would be good for making soup because it's Wait, dry. There's... Oh my God, <laughs> this thing is huge. <laughs> Look. You cannot buy something like that at the market. No. Look at this. What? I know, this is a stash from an acorn jay. Oh my gosh, an acorn jay? Think of a woodpecker. Yeah. It creates a hole and then will stick this little acorn right there. And it's designed in such a way that even a squirrel cannot pick it up because it's too hard to pick up. And that's what's funny about wild food. If you don't know something, then you are not going to see it. You train your eyes and go like, oh my God, it's everywhere. So this is your stinging nettle. This is the best for food. How to recognize stinging nettle? Well, you got a little needle on the side right there. And as the name say, it will sting you. So you're not safe grabbing any part of it. No. So Here? what you do is you go like this, you grab yeah. them and then cut the top. Oh, grab and cut easy. The top. Grab and cut the top. You're like a machine. Yeah. But feel it between. <laughs> it's like stab me! <laughs> this really hurts. <laughs> 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 okay. 
Look at those beautiful old flowers right there. So this is how you recognize oxalis. Mm. So you basically have three perfect heart-shaped leaves, and then you have little purple dots on the leaves. That's very noticeable. Yeah. Flavor profile for that one, pure lemon. Try it. Mmm! Oh. Wow! It's like straight up lemon juice. <laughs> <laughs> so with oxalis, can you make dessert with it or what would you usually make with it? It's not a plant that you want to use in large quantity because it contains a lot of oxalic acid. So think of it like rhubarb. I mean, you find oxalic acid in a lot of food, but this would be a little bit more worse than rhubarb. Some people have died from eating large quantity, like in a soup. So no soups? No soups. No soups. No soups I'll make none of that. Maybe yeah. just a garnish. Garnish. Yeah. That's, if it, that's the way to think yeah. like garnish. So this is our bounty. So this is your sting in it all. We got some dry mushroom and some beautiful fresh mushroom, oyster mushroom. Then we got our chickweed right here. We have our shovel, there is our shovel. We got our oxalis. So that's what you have to play with. Aside from the manners and lettuce, which is really everywhere, everything else is invasive. So this goes back to the conversation about reframing what you think is a weed. Yeah. Foraging or wildcrafting can be done in such a way that you're actually helping nature. So much chemicals are being sprayed on those plants that if you can turn them into food, maybe, you know, food can be a small part of that solution to the environmental issues, and that will be a positive. So, you know, what I'm trying to do is change the narrative a little bit and start lo looking at some of those plants as what they are, which is gourmet food. Awesome. I think I have a lot of options here. Yay! Thank you! <laughs> <laughs> I collected a lot of plants with Pascal. So I'm gonna do a bit of brainstorming to figure out what I want to make and I'll meet you guys back in my kitchen. Welcome to my kitchen. As I was thinking about what dish, what meal I wanted to create with these foraged foods, one thing that stuck out to me was why not make my meal accessible? Pascal did suggest making a nettle soup. So I'm thinking, I can go Panera style. I'll make a soup, sandwich, and salad. So let's get cooking. The first thing I have to do with nettle is pick the leaves off the stems. Got my gloves on. It's actually not painful at all when you have gloves. I was reading that you need to soak them in warm water before I blanch them just to kind of clean them out a bit. We got the water boiling. Let that do its thing for five minutes, and then I'm gonna have to blanch the leaves to remove the spikes, and then I'll make the soup. Had to change my shirt because wearing a turtleneck in this hot apartment with no AC is a dumb move. For the soup, we are starting off with olive oil. We're going to put some onions in here. Let that cook for a minute. Now we're adding some potatoes, carrot, and garlic. Let's add some veggie stock. You know what's crazy about this nettle leaf situation after I've blanched it? There is such a small amount left. I think ideally I should have more for a soup, but I think this is enough to infuse the nettle leaf flavor into the soup, fingers crossed. So one tip that I do have is if you are going to be picking multiple items, make sure you bag them in different bags because they will get intertwined with each other. This is what I'm talking about. So here's the chickweed. This, it's all intertwined and I'm having to separate them out into different bowls. Now, we're gonna make the pesto. This is the amount of chickweed that I'm using. We're gonna add some parm, some garlic. Instead of pine nuts, I'm choosing to use walnuts. Of course, salt, olive oil, got some lemon juice. Blend this bad boy up. Actually, it looks pretty good. Taste it. Hmm. Hmm. There is definitely a grassy flavor coming through. Tastes taste like grass. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mind it. This is how the soup looks after 20 minutes. I'm going to get an immersion blender in here and start blending it up so it's one homogenous mixture. So the soup is looking pretty good. The color is not the best color, I will admit, but. Let's taste it to see if it tastes good, if it's edible. Hmm. The nettle flavor kind of got lost. Sad face. So now I'm going to pan fry 
the oyster mushrooms that we foraged. Just have a little olive oil in the pan. Toss some garlic in with these beautiful mushrooms. Oh wow, they smell delicious. It's like a very earthy scent. I actually think I'm going to add some chili flakes for a bit of heat. Look how beautiful and brown and crispy these guys are. Oh my gosh. So we got some sourdough bread. Putting this pesto on there. What a gorgeous green color. Let's place the mushrooms on. Oh, these babies look so good. To finish it off, I'm gonna put some oxalis on there. Oh yeah, look at that. You guys, I really worked up a sweat in my kitchen getting all this together and I'm so proud of how this final product looks. Look at this beautiful meal. Oh my gosh, so gorgeous. Hello. Hey girl. Good, so I just created a meal and I was wondering if you'd be down to come over and taste it with me. Oh yeah, that sounds yummy. I will see you soon then. Welcome. Thank you. So I have quite the meal for you. Before I tell you what it is, I just want you to taste it. Ooh, well the soup looks really good. Ooh, I like it. I think there's definitely garlic in that. And I see something orange, like carrot. Yeah. Well, most of the things that are on your plate mm -hmm. are foraged. Okay. The soup is a nettle soup. Nettle. Oh. Yeah. The sandwich situation, mm -hmm. it's a chickweed pesto. Chickweed? Chickweed, yeah. Like chickpea? <laughs> is it related to chickpea? <laughs> no. Okay. And then the mushrooms are oyster mushrooms, which I foraged with Pascal. The mm -hmm. greens on top. That's oxalis. Wow. Yeah. This is as local as it gets. Mmm. Too good. Like, really? <laughs> I didn't know what to expect, you know? Just Foraging with Pascal was such an eye opening experience. I went in expecting to find some cool wild plants with unique flavor profiles, which I certainly did. But I didn't expect to challenge my perspective on what I consider food. Basically, every single plant we foraged is considered a weed by society standards. And with that label and stigma, I would have considered them inedible and valueless. But as you guys saw, I was able to make delicious and edible dishes with them. And they were Chloe verified. These plants are mainly considered as weeds because they're non-native. And this, my friends, is plant discrimination. As Pascal touched on yesterday, the only reason why these weeds are getting treated with herbicides is because they're non-native to the area, not because they're causing harm to the environment. And so what we're talking about here is really a food waste issue. If people knew how delicious, nutritious, and edible these plants are, then maybe we would view them as food, not as weeds and a waste of space. Honestly, I didn't expect foraging to get political, but in 2020, where the effects of climate change are becoming a harsh reality, I think it's important to talk about sustainable food sourcing. Foraging and eating non-native plants, or weeds as we consider them, fall perfectly within that conversation. So I'll leave you all with a little challenge. The next time you come across a weed, I want you to ask yourself, is this really a pest and valueless, or is it secretly a source of food? Really proud of myself, you guys. Really proud of myself. <laughs> the forging award. The forging award goes to Nicole. Goes to Nicole. <laughs> Look, good food, good mood. I mean, it happened. It's it happened. Real. That's real. That's real. <laughs>